the beat goes on. So this room, Becky, we've dedicated to trade beads, and there's beads in this room that really are, were traded all around the world and in different time periods. They're some of the oldest beads in the exhibit are in this room. But these beautiful beads, these are Southwest, right? Yes, these are a collection of beads that I have brought back from uh, Arizona, New Mexico predominantly, because I... My sister lives in New Mexico, and I've lived in Arizona for a long time. So here we have some uh, some Navajo stamped silver work up here with a uh, bracelet that was made with some coral cabochons. And those I bought at the Indian market. In New Mexico, they always have in uh, in the Zocalo area of Taos. The Indians like to sit outside along the around the the Zocalo, and they put blankets out with their jewelry on, and then you can walk around and look at it and buy it, purchase what you'd like. So those were purchased from there, and then this is a, a sample. I have samples of Zuni fetish necklaces, which the fetishes represent different animals and spirits, and they're used as amulets and protection necklaces. Uh, then I have a couple more examples of the fetish or the bracelets down here that with coral and turquoise, which are always really popular in the Southwest. And then I have uh, a sample of some 1920 Hubble beads, which were back in the 1920s during that era, people were starting to travel out west, and they were looking at all the uh, turquoise and Indian jewelry from the different tribes. And so Czechoslovakia, which, is a, which they are masters at reproducing beads that look like other things or that imitate other things like turquoise or coral or shells or bones. So anyway, this was their uh, attempt to make a uh, more reasonably priced turquoise bead to sell to the, uh, to the natives, Americans that were making jewelry and also to the tourist trade that were traveling out west. So they were popular to about 1928, and then I think the fad kind of died down. This big structure here, this is called a Dogon ladder, and it's from Mali. It's from the Dogon tribe, and probably came from Timbuktu, Timbuktu, which we otherwise would call Timbuktu. But it, Dogon ladders are made because the entrance to the Dogon houses are like on the roof and so they make these little ladders so that they can climb up and get in down into their house because uh, then at night they pull the ladder up so that wild animals and things don't get into their houses. These are made out of ironwood and they are in ebony wood and they're very very heavy they're like solid. So then I have a collection of beads hanging off here. These are bead, hanks of beads. And this is a what I call a conglomerate necklace. And these are all sorts of trade beads and old vintage trade beads and pieces of carnelian and different and quartz and things from Mali that they have wired, they've wired each bead individually on there, making kind of a conglomerate necklace. And th this is a collection of what they would call wafer beads from the Venetian bead era when they were making a lot of chevrons and uh, like cane type beads. So this is a collection of those and there's also some smaller metal wafer type beads, little flat beads. Those are probably from Ghana. And then we have, these are some uh, 
powdered, this is powdered or recycled glass from Ghana. These are some clay beads, etched clay beads from Mali. These are Ghana beads. These are uh, recycled glass and then they've done like some painting with some uh, some type of a cr or glass that's been like made into a type of paint where they paint it on. And then we have, these are old trade beads. This is a combination of old Venetian trade beads from the 1800s up to the 19th, 1900s and a few pieces of amber. And this is what they would call the Guinea-Bissau amber. And then I have, this is a collection of uh, carnelian agate from Mali. Here's a, these are some really old ones that are kind of um, matte finish. They've been worn, and so you can see how they kind of get mattified from over the years and the use. Here, this is a big collection of, this is another sample of the genius of the uh Czechoslovakian making faux type items. This is what they would, their rendition of faux coral. When coral started getting very popular uh, and was very expensive for like the everyday man. So they they made coral looking beads. And these are also, some of these are made from in Nigeria. They started making like some faux coral looking beads. These big green beads are recycled glass from Ghana, and they are, they're very contemporary. These are very new, and these are also some Ghana glass beads or recycled glass beads. They're very big bead makers. It's a big industry for them there, and these, these are all vintage trade beads, Venetian, there's some millefleur, there's mostly millefleur in here, and then there's some cane, and there's just all different kind of cool stuff in there. And down, oh, here, these are more, these are more Ghana glass beads. This is a newer, very contemporary style. They're doing the little wafer beads, and they started making more smaller beads. They've really upped their bead game because beads have become so popular, and especially in America, the these are also some Ghana glass trade beads. Well, they're they're not they're samples. They're like uh, their rendition of what a trade bead like, or you know their version of a trade bead. Only it's more modern, and it's made out of recycled glass. And these are some old, I love these. These are called conus shell beads, and they're also from Czechoslovakia around the 1920s. They're kind of art deco looking, but they were trying to imitate the conus shells that were very popular at that time. But I think, I love these. I think they look very art deco-y. And these are some more uh, solid glass cobalt glass from Czechoslovakia, or no, actually, I'm sorry, these are from Germany. These are the old German glass. And then, moving up, we have this beautiful uh, beaded trim piece, like a wall piece from the Banjara tribe of Pakistan. And this would be a decorative item that they'd hang on their wall or uh, maybe inside their tent or... Anyway, it's, it's a, like a home deck embellishment item. But it's all hand beaded and it's very beautiful and I would be glad to hang it on my wall. So this case, Becky, is one of my favorite cases and I love seeing these beads in here. Because these are chevron beads, uh, primarily made in Venice, right? Yes. And they, they, collectors love them for the different layers because it's layers of glass with different colors, kind of alternating colors that are ground down to make the chevron. But the, the Venetians have been making chevron beads 
for over 500 years or so. Yeah, definitely. And they were traded all over the world and highly sought after a lot of the blues and things. And you had, you know, five layers, six layers, seven layers. The more layers, the, the, the better often. Um, and what we're looking at here is there's beads in here that are 500 years old. Is that yes, right? Yeah. And then there's beads that may only be 300 years old. And, and, and there's some that are maybe two years old. Right. There's some very contemporary Well, beads. actually, yeah. Very um, contemporary. That's what I um, mean. So... So this is, I love, I love the patterns in chevron beads myself, and I, I love this case. But the Venetians didn't just make chevron beads, right? Oh, correct. They so, made many different types of beads. And, and we've got another small case here with other Venetian beads in it. What are we looking at there? All right. Here you are looking at, like, the creme to the creme, what the collectors are looking for because they were worn by the upper crust of the of Venice and so we have <clears throat> down here or these this outer layer of beads those are called the Lewis and Clark beads and they were very big uh, beads back in the 1800s uh, then we have these little flat beads, which are some of my favorite. Those are called the end of the day beads because they would take like the bead kings that they had left over from the end of the day when they were making their beads and they would just like smash them out, flatten them, and then they'd, you know, put them, make the beads out of them. And then we have these <clears throat> next two, or well, the next one is a very fancy bead. Uh, it's just called a feathery bead. And then above it, the white with the dots, those are called skunk. Well, they call them skunk beads, but they're just mostly dotty beads. But they were very popular also. And uh, then we have the one above that is called the ambassador bead. And that's also a very uh, highly collectible bead worn by the uh, upper crust. And then the the ones above are also those are some lamp work beads that have like some uh, <clears throat> metal polychrome like gold polychrome designs layered on the outside after they they blow or they they lamp work them and then they they keep adding like those little flowery designs on and the same with the little white with the, the orange dots those are also they 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 wind the bead and then they apply the uh decoration onto the outside of it with a little torch and uh tool so that's and then oh yeah down here we have some, these little flat beads those are called ghost beads and i think because the little image on them kind of looks ghosty and then we have some more of the little dotty beads and and some more of those little feathery beads. I don't know. For some reason, I want to call those little green feathery beads opera beads, but I don't know if that's the correct name, but they look like something you should wear to the opera, I think. The beat goes on. The beat goes on.